You can turn in the hymnal to uh, 521 for Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me songs. to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to 
As we come into our time of our, our giving this morning, I just think about uh, as we have a time to give and to give back. We give because of all that God has done for us. When we think back in the Old Testament days when they gave sacrifices, they were doing that to honor the Lord and all that he has done uh, for them. So as we come to our time of offering today, just, just be in the spirit that um, how much the Lord has done for us. And we give to the Lord uh, for our praises uh, and all that he's done. Let us be in spirit of prayer. Almighty God, the God of all creation, we're humbled that you would want to spend time with us, that you care for us, that you forgive us. Lord, we ask your blessings on these tithes, these offerings, these gifts this morning. Let they go to the furtherment of your kingdom and just bring a praise to you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What brings you into my office today? Well, I'm, I'm really down, and I'm depressed, and just really lonely. Oh, no, lonely. Have you guys ever felt lonely before? Or you felt like you were all by yourself? Oh, no. Okay, well, let me see here. Okay, how long has this been going on, Jim? Uh, for weeks now. It just doesn't seem to go away. Oh, no, that's not good. That seems like a long time to feel lonely, don't you guys think? Well, I do have a recommendation. I have a prescription for you. Luckily, I have my pharmacist on speed dial. Oh, hey, Lydia. I need a prescription for loneliness de delivered ASAP, please. Okay, great. Thank you. This should fix you right up, Jim. Oh, the Holy Bible. Look at that. All right, Jim. So my recommendation to you is to read the Bible every day. At least five minutes. Not, not long, okay? And then in the back, you'll find, it's not really a phone number exactly, but if you go like this, can you guys show him how to do it? Go like this. And you close your eyes, and you say, Dear God, and you tell him whatever's going on, whether it's loneliness or something else, and he'll hook you right up, okay? Does that sound okay, Jim? 
Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Next. It me too. So, although I have to say, wow, you guys are awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. Man. Uh, how many of uh, you adults would be willing to do that? Some of you, a few of you. Stephen's done it. <laughs> oh, well. The scripture that Camden read comes from Mark chapter 10. I invite you to have that in front of you um, for the message today. And I have to say, present company excluded, but generally speaking, children can be kind of a mess. Right? You all know it's true. Come on. Yeah. There is no creature that makes such incessant demands on their parents. Reptiles, they just lay eggs and then hope for the best. Birds, they usually have one season in which they can pack everything that they need to pack into that little baby bird's brain so that they can survive. Uh, and then they're on their own. Mammals? They take a little longer usually, maybe a couple of years of nurturing, but human children are another story. It's not weeks, it's not months, or even years. It's something like decades uh, before they seem like they can actually make it. Medical research has proven this to be true. The adolescent brain continues to form synapses and things all the way to 24 years of age. Those of you who've had 24-year-old kids, you'll probably go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. There are very few instinctual behaviors for kids, they're, they're for, for people, human beings. Uh, the ones that we have, they're buried pretty deep inside. Mostly, this is how we do it. We learn, we grow, we develop, and we mature, and it takes time and effort. I know this is true. Not just because I've read about it and studied it. Not just because I've witnessed it as a parent, uh, but because I was a child once, and I was a pretty big mess. My dad is not here to confirm that, but he did nod in the early service that that was true. <sighs> there are probably a lot of ways I'm still a mess, but there's a particular messiness to childhood that I'm, I'm glad that I've left behind, which is why this passage, the Canada Red, has such a tension in it. Uh, the, the tension comes when we think about what Jesus seems to be saying about children in the Gospels and what we know about the character of children. In Matthew 18, 3, Jesus says that unless we change and become like children, we're not going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. But that can't be right, can it? For those of you who've spent some time around kids, you, 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 you wonder. Children can be so childish sometimes children spill their milk they won't eat their vegetables they throw tantrums again present company excluded but they they throw tantrums when they don't get their way they bite sometimes they cry they sleep all day and then they get up in the middle of the night and wake you up and then they get older 
And they get all full of sass and talk back and sulk and pout and they don't say please and they don't say thank you and they keep hitting you up for money. Call me crazy, but I, 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 something tells me that this is not what Jesus is talking about when he says that we're supposed to become like children. And just to be clear, if you're a kid and you're hearing this and it sounds like I'm picking on you, know that the adults are going to get their fair share here in a little bit. If you noticed from the text, Jesus is not mad at the kids, but the adults. So let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, we need to step back and take a look at the big picture in the Gospels about what Jesus, how Jesus views children, how he interacts with children, his, his response to children. And what we see from that big picture perspective is that Jesus loves children. Loves children. Which isn't a surprise, right? You kind of saw that one coming, right, with Jesus. But it is actually a, a pretty significant point when you consider the context where Jesus lived and the place that he inhabited. See, back then, in that first century period, children, well, they didn't figure very prominently. They weren't really valued for the Gentiles, the folks that weren't Jewish. The children, they were cared for, but they were cared for sort of in the way that you would care for an asset. You take care of it because it's valuable to you. They're representative of the wealth of the household and the potential for the future that that household would continue. You see, if a, if a Gentile family, particularly one of the, uh, the more prominent ones or affluent ones, if they didn't really need any more children, uh, sometimes babies would be left out on the doorstep in the elements. Maybe somebody would pick them up and, and take them home as their own slave. Maybe they would just be left out to die. That's how they dealt with this. Now, in the Jewish culture that Jesus was a part of, uh, kids were more valuable than that. They were cherished a little more, but really not that much more. This is a time when there's a lot of infant mortality, when kids died young frequently. And it was, it was hard for people to invest too much in a child that might pass away from malnutrition or disease or something else. You see this in the Gospels. In the majority of interactions that Jesus has with children, they are about invariably someone coming to Jesus with a child in hopes that he would heal them, restore them, raise them from the dead. Often it was the only child that the person had. So while this attitude towards children, it might seem a little callous to us, it might seem a little indifferent, the culture, they were just being pragmatic. Once a child reached a certain age, a reasonable age, 12 or 13, well, folks felt, yeah, they're probably going to make it now. And so they were be welcomed into that adult part of the community. Childhood was just that interim period between being a baby, being born, and adulthood. Something you got through before you started your actual life. People loved their kids, I'm sure, but it was just a different time. Children filled a different slot in society than they do today. And that slot, it didn't come with a lot of benefits. But Jesus has a profoundly different way of interacting with children. We've already mentioned that, the way that he, all the instances where he responded to their sickness and even their death, he, he, he helped them. He even reached beyond his own Jewish community to heal the children of the Gentiles. He frees them from demons. Jesus heals almost as many kids as he does adults. He's always helping young people. And so Jesus clearly does not see them the way that the society does, as some sort of a disposable component. And then we have two stories. These two stories, uh, exchanges between the disciples and Jesus regarding children. So these two stories, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have both of these conversations. Matthew and Luke are probably drawing from Mark. So we have six different passages of scripture. The first of them, the first set of stories, what's found in Mark 9, as well as Matthew 18 and Luke 9, that has to do with the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The disciples, you know, being who they are, they, they get to arguing about who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is. And Jesus takes who? A child. 
And he takes a child and he puts it right in their midst, right in the center so they can all see it and says, there you go. You want to know about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, here he is, this child. Now we're going to come back to that story in a bit because it helps us understand what Jesus is talking about in the second story. And the second one is the one that, that Camden read from Mark 12 or Mark 10. It's also in Matthew 19 and in Luke 18. And in most of your Bibles, it probably is headed, Jesus blesses the children. So what we have here are two different stories told in three different ways, each with a little bit of a theological spin on it that makes it unique. But because they are really all so similar, they're all talking about children, all talking about the way that Jesus approaches children, we might have a tendency to look at them and, and mush them all together into a single story, into a single idea. And we shouldn't do that. We need to tease them apart a little bit in order to really resolve this tension that I mentioned earlier. The fact that Jesus seems to want us to be like children, and yet we know what children are like. So let's get back to that first story. There, we, we, we have to understand something that's going on there. The, in each of the gospel accounts, Jesus is confronting pride. The pride and the vanity of his disciples. They're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. I'm the greatest. No, no, I'm the greatest. Jesus likes me the best. I don't know where he stands on you all, but he likes me really, really well, and therefore I must be the greatest. And they're arguing about this uh, uh, amongst themselves. And in Matthew, Jesus says, you know, I'm going to tell you. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever hum becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so that's the first thread that I want to tease out here so, so that we can get at what Jesus is actually saying. In this story, Jesus says that the characteristic of children that the disciples need to copy is humility that's entirely appropriate considering what their conversation was about it's not a humble conversation they were having a very prideful conversation now neither mark nor luke highlight this particular characteristic the way that matthew does they simply say that those who welcome children those who serve children are placing themselves in a humble position in relation to those children. And in that humble position, that's going to be a little weird for the people of that day. They don't understand that. Nobody served children. I mean, they're, they're just there taking up space. You, you maybe throw some food at them once in a while to make sure they're all right, but, but nobody serves children. Nobody welcomes children. You just tend to them until they reach a reasonable age. And then they matter. Serving them in the manner that Jesus is talking about, welcoming them in the same way that they would welcome Jesus himself, that is a radical departure from the way things were, from the status quo. But even though that is part of the first story, that, that idea of, of taking on this characteristic of humility, it's not actually what Jesus is talking about in the second story. In the second story, the one from Mark's passage uh, today specifically, when Jesus says, truly I tell you, whoever does, not receive the, whoever, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it, he's not saying that you need to be like a child in order to receive the kingdom. Even though he's kind of hinting at that in the previous story, yes, there are childlike characteristics, or more appropriately, characteristics that we associate with children. They are in the first set of stories, things that the people of God would do well to copy, things like humility. But Jesus is not saying that we should behave childishly, even though we do at times. Again, we have to be careful not to mush these stories together. Yes, there are these childlike characteristics that are good for disciples to practice. 
But we have to understand the way that children were viewed back in this first century setting to get a clear picture of what Jesus is saying here in the second story. Now, what's happening in the text, what's going on, isn't that uncommon. People would often bring their children to a religious leader, a teacher, a rabbi, in order for them to receive a blessing. That was fairly common. And if it was convenient, if it fit into the schedule, yeah, their blessing would be, would be granted. They would get it. And Jesus, by this point, Jesus has gotten pretty famous. He's traveling around the region and he's teaching with authority and he's healing people and it's pretty incredible. So he's got this great reputation and undoubtedly there are some people with some hope that Jesus could somehow, with this blessing, place a little hedge of protection around their kids so that maybe things would go well with them. They wanted the best for their kids, like we do today, even though it's a different time. So this blessing becomes some kind of a protective medicine uh, for them, a preventative, in in a time when the spiritual and the physical flowed together so freely. So, parents, maybe, the text doesn't say, somebody brings these kids to Jesus in hopes for a blessing. They want to receive a blessing, and the disciples, (laughs) oh man, apparently oblivious uh, to what Jesus had just told them about children in the previous chapter, the disciples are trying to prevent them from getting any closer. Nope, 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 You you can't come up here. Don't bother Jesus. We don't want any ankle biters coming up here and getting in the way. Don't don't let them come close. They're trying to prevent these kids from getting close to Jesus, and it ticks Jesus off. I know that's probably hard to hear, isn't it? Jesus doesn't get ticked off, does he? Jesus doesn't get mad. Oh, yes, he does. There aren't a lot of times in the Gospels that that tell us that Jesus got mad, but this is one of them. In the NRSV, it says Jesus was indignant. I don't think that's a great word. It is a a translation of the Greek, which I'm not going to try to pronounce because I'll butcher it. But the Greek also carries the meaning of vexed, irritated, annoyed, angry. That's what the word means. Jesus is angry that the disciples would be so arrogant that they, they, would, they would bar these little ones from coming to him. He just told them not, not that long ago to, that, that they should welcome children. You guys want to be the greatest in the kingdom? Then welcome kids. And here they are doing the exact opposite. So Jesus may be a little bit annoyed with them, for sure, that they forget the lesson so quickly. But I think that his primary concern is that these kids, well, they deserve a blessing. They need to be blessed. And the disciples are blocking that blessing. So there's two things going on in this story at Camden Red. First of all, there's the blessing of the children. That's the context. That's what's happening. Jesus wants them to come near and receive this blessing. He wants them to draw close. He wants the best for them. He loves them. He loves them and he values them in a way that nobody else did in that culture. And so if you want a lesson as the followers of Jesus who want to live out the example that Jesus set in his life, well, there's your lesson. We need to value these kids too. But that's not all that's here. There's a deeper lesson in the story. It's sandwiched between the indignation and the blessing. And to get to it, we've got to understand who children are. See, again, for Jesus, children were a little different than what they might be for us. It's not the inherent characteristics of childhood that Jesus values, the the messiness Because as, you know, basically little humans, they can be a mess at times, as all humans can be. Children can be selfish and petulant and angry and covetous and dishonest, all the things that we as adults struggle with. Children are childish. So being like that and valuing that, no, that's not, not what Jesus is getting at. What we need to get our heads around is this idea of what children were in Jesus' day. Children had nothing. 
They had no power. They had no authority. They couldn't control anything. They had no freedom. Does it sound like that is the way it is today too? A little bit. <laughs> Trust me. Today, kids have a lot more than those kids did. They got really nothing. They were completely, absolutely, 100% dependent on the mercy and the good graces of those that cared for them. A children by himself, a children alone, that child was lost. That child was probably going to die. So for Jesus, when he sees a child, he's not seeing the mess. He's not seeing the humanness. What he sees there is the most vulnerable and the most dependent member of that society. We're going to talk a little more about this next week when we look at the story of the rich man. But there's a certain way that society was set up back in that day. And Mark records it here. There's a sequence in these stories that we see in chapter 10. The first one, the one we looked at last week, that's divorce. The second one, the one we're looking at today, is about children. And the third one is about wealth. And each story carries through this major theme, the prominence and the problem of patriarchy. You see, in the first, Jesus is protecting women from male-centered rules about divorce. Because women didn't have much in that society. They were vulnerable and dependent. In this story, Jesus is protecting children from the very same system. And in the third, the rich man's wealth, that is identified as a barrier to faithfulness. Wives, children, wealth, these are all just possessions of the paterfamilias, the head of the household. And the traditional way of managing possessions, well, that runs right up against the kingdom ethic that Jesus is teaching. Seeing where this story comes in Mark's bigger story, it helps us understand what Jesus is talking about when he talks about children. It's not that inherent childishness, for sure. It's, in this story, it's not even about the humility, uh, which is highlighted in Matthew. In fact, that humility that, that Jesus brings forward and that Matthew records, that's not the child's own inherent humility, because children aren't that humble, you know, that... that they can be very self-focused at times, uh, and rightly so. That's how God designed them. That's how they survive. Uh, but they, we don't go on that way our whole lives. No, this humility that Jesus is talking about, it's more about their status, their place in society than their character. It's certainly what he's talking about here. Jesus is talking about vulnerability and dependence. And what Jesus wants his followers to copy is not that childish character of children. He wants us to take on the status of children. Take a look at what he says. This is where you get to use your Bibles that I invited you to have open. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child receives it will not enter it. In this statement, Jesus is talking about how we respond. Respond to the possibility of the kingdom, not how we possess it. Not how it becomes ours. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a gift. It is given to us. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't control it. It is offered to us as grace. And so I want you to think a little bit about how someone might respond to the kingdom if they thought that they were owed it, like it was supposed to be theirs, that it wasn't a gift at all, but that it was some kind of an obligation that God had to meet because that person was so awesome and so powerful. You know, see, powerful people Powerful people, people with position and authority, gatekeepers like the disciples who thought that they were hot stuff because they'd been traveling along with the Messiah. These are the kind of people who respond to the kingdom as if it were some kind of wage that they had earned. Well, yeah, of course I belong in the kingdom. I mean, look at me. Look at all that I have done. 
In fact, I'll tell you right now, I suspect that I might even be the greatest in the kingdom. What they want, how they want to live, what sort of system or society that they want to create, these are all of the things that powerful people think about. Powerful people want to refashion the kingdom of God in a way that suits them, in a way that they get what they want without having to give too much. Powerful people are all about those hierarchies, about who's on top and who's below and who's underneath that. And Jesus says, you know what? It's these kind of people that have a hard time getting into the kingdom. As adults, we have a tendency to fall into that powerful person trap. Power is relative. It's not about reaching a certain threshold above which you have power and below which you don't. We all have some power. We all have some uh, authority over others and others have authority over us. It's a ladder and we find ourselves on that ladder and it happens all around us out in the world, it happens in our families, it happens in the church. And the adult temptation is to grab more power, to get more independence, to have more autonomy, more freedom, to have the capacity to do what we want to do. And a sign of that power, a symptom of it, is this gatekeeping. Setting up structures that are designed to let some in and keep others out. Gatekeeping, well, that's a sign that we have reached a certain level of maturity. We have earned the right to set the pattern and order the life of others. Let me tell you what you should do. Let me tell you how to live. Let me tell you how close you can get to Jesus. That's what you see in the disciples. Those that thought that they were authoritative and mature enough to decide on Jesus' behalf (laughs) who would get a blessing and who wouldn't. And we still do this. We still rank and we order and we, and we design and, and we, 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 we try to decide who gets to come close to God and who doesn't. Life needs order. I get that. I believe that. But, but our attempts to impose order are more about our desire to control than they are about creating harmony. You see, we think that X, Y, Z is right. And it's right and it's right And we're not shy about making sure that X, Y, Z is exactly how everybody lives, following those rules. And we will impose that on those that have less power. After all, we have earned that right, right? But what Jesus says is that the kingdom is difficult for powerful people to enter because powerful people think they know best. And they're not willing to let God be in control. Vulnerable people, dependent people, childlike people, they see more clearly. They see their own failings, their own weaknesses. Through long practice, they hold their convictions lightly because they realize that they only see a part. The glass is still dark. They see they're, they're humble, not because they are inherently humble, that that is something that they are, but because that they, they know where they stand. They know their status. Interestingly, they probably internalize that humility to the point now that it starts to come out as an inherent quality. But above all, dependent people, vulnerable people, They know exactly where they stand with God. See, they're not gatekeepers for God. They are children of God. Beloved, it is good to be the children of God. 
Because God is, they know that God is more than powerful enough to keep his own gate. God doesn't need us for that. What God wants isn't gatekeepers. God wants children. Because God wants to love us. And God wants us to come in for a good, long hug. Let's pray. Abba, Father, forgive us of our maturity. Forgive us when we think that we have finally learned enough to know best. Forgive us when we fail to see our utter and complete dependency upon you. Forgive us when we have not been like children. Vulnerable enough to need your protection and your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you for the example of young ones. The example of dependency and vulnerability and the need to rely upon you. Help us to learn that lesson well. We pray in the name of the one who welcomed all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is Sunday, and tomorrow is Monday. No amount of worry will change that. Let's move forward, confident in God's ability to get us through it all.